Welcome to Convergence. My name is Michael Doran. I'm a California attorney. Albert Einstein once stated that among the most difficult problems in all of physics was Earth's magnetic field. I'm a California attorney and I'm going to argue that the Earth's magnetic field is actually the most difficult problem in all of biology. There's a really good series that PBS has been putting out called Ian's, but unfortunately it amplifies the, the state of the science today in terms of sort of a catastrophism that a volcano erupts and it causes an extinction or, or the earth develops a snowball uh, uh, earth and and that causes an extinction or um, you know some other catastrophic event causes an extinction my argument is that the most difficult problem the earth and life has had to solve a living earth and the problem that the life has had to solve is earth's magnetic field to, to, blow, to, to put it in really simple terms, if the Earth's magnetic field is too strong, you develop a planet that attracts the dust and the chemicals from, from space, and you get a planet like Jupiter or Saturn, a giant gas ball, and it's a dead planet. If the Earth's magnetic field is too weak, then you end up with Mars, where its core has solidified and cooled and solidified and the magnetic field has become very weak and then the atmosphere gets stripped away by space weather, by solar winds, and so forth. So the first problem that life had to actually solve in, in cloud droplets, the nucleotides, it had to solve Earth's magnetic field. And um, and, and so that's the source of life and there is ample proof just like an art, a lawyer would argue about a murder case or some other type of uh, legal argument it's we're talking about science true but also it's an argument as you put together a model it's a difference between reducing a problem to simpler parts and then constructing and, and, and describing what's the, what are the mechanisms involved. And my assumptions then begin with the Earth's magnetic field is the most pressing or important or dominating problem that life had to solve. And, and from that perspective, then you understand what has been occurring over time. And grand time scales really help us because um, even though it's hard for us to think in terms of big time scales, big time scales move certain variables around that make us understand, um, given the evidence that we have of early Earth and what it was doing and what we see now and what life we see and how life is now, it, it helps us to go on these grand time scales. And when you start talking about electrical things that are going on and then ultimately what the Earth's magnetic field is doing, you have to start with the, the most serious inputs into what's going on. And so that you start out with the sun. And the problem with the sun is just like any star, the, the sun is becoming um, more luminous. And since life formed about 3.7 billion years ago, the sun has become 25% more luminous. And, and so that energy has had to be, uh, that added, added en energy that comes into the Earth system has had to be adapted to and, and dampened and, and modulated by life. Life had to, has to solve that. 
When it comes to Earth's magnetic field, another problem that the Earth has had over again these great time scales is keeping the inner part of the Earth warm. Now, the way at first this has been done was the moon's, uh, what is the moon, is a result of collision of uh, something from space that hit the Earth and then was in a, a shallow orbit. And then over time, the orbit has become greater and greater. And that's indicative that orbital change is indicative of energy that has gone into friction, like rubbing your hands. The, the movement of the moon around the Earth has kept the inside of the Earth warm and therefore conductive. But over time, as the moon has increased its orbit, and energy can't be destroyed, it, it just changes form. So if that energy from the close orbit moves out and it's in a bigger orbit and it's lost the energy from friction, then when the moon is away at a farther distance, you don't have 50 foot tides, then the amount of warming that's going on inside the Earth is changing, and then the conductivity is changing, and then therefore the Earth's magnetic field would have changed. And this is a random thing, this isn't controlled. So you had to deal with not just the fact that the sun is getting brighter, but the Earth through, through the friction that, it, that the moon caused was changing and it wasn't steady. And life had to, to calculate a, a way to, to do this. Now the way you often hear the great oxidation event described as a giant extinction event where so many species, not species, ar archaea, uh, uh, simple one-celled life, fit the oldest of life, um, was, de was destroyed by the fact that there is now oxygen uh, introduced. But most of the planet was water. And so if most of the life was, was not creating oxygen, but was, was um, using oxygen, using free oxygen, so where did that oxygen come from? Didn't it get all used up? It, it kind of reminds me of a math problem that I had when I was in college uh, in a practical math class and was looking at populations and, and sinusoidal functions to solve uh, a function of, of involving discrete populations. So if you can imagine you have a grassy knoll and um, a and rabbit is introduced to that grassy knoll then the rabbit will, uh, if it's a closed system, the rabbits will multiply and grow and eat all the grass and pretty soon there, there won't be any grass and, and the rabbits will all die. And, uh, and so if you introduce a predator into that microecology, then the, let's say it's a, a hawk or a wolf or whatever the predator is, and it starts eating the rabbits and um, reduces their size, then the grass isn't all ate up and the, the, uh, the, the, the rabbits and the hawk or the, or the predator or the wolf, whatever, sur all, they all survive because there, there isn't a self-check with the rabbit eating all the grass. Well, it's the same problem with simple life that if you have a if you have something that only consumes one particular kind of chemical um, it's going to remove all of the CO2 um, so like if you have a methanogen it's going to take CO2 and, and uh, hydrogen 
and produce methane. Or um, you might get bacteria that eat methane um, and produce CO2. But at, at some point, there is a lack of oxygen if, if these, without an independent source. So I'm, I'm not a fan of th this idea that plants cause the extinction uh, of, or early simple bacteria that had photosynthesis. I, I don't believe that, that there was a, a one-way thing where this great oxidation uh, event occurred without some other pressure there to, um, to, to cause it to move in that direction as actually for the whole ecology to be a surviving event. So, and, and the name of this show is Convergence and, and we just had a significant snow out here in California. I'm a California lawyer uh, following a drought and um, and part of the thing that I've been monitoring for decades now is uh, space weather and in particular uh, when the sun gets very active with sunspots and how x-rays come from the sun and um, and, and in my view uh, it causes the ozone to be even more ionized and then that changes the electrical behavior in the upper atmosphere and we just observed the, the lightning flashes which are from the worldwide uh, lightning monitoring at uh, the University of Washington. Um, I noticed that the strike totals went from about 700,000 uh, strikes per hour all the way up to uh, 750, 750,000 strikes per hour following an X class x-ray event that occurred. Very rare explosive x-ray event that would have ionized the ozone layer even more. And then the strikes as, a, as the event settled went back down to like 600,000 uh, strikes per hour. And you might say, well, you know, what difference does that make? Well, the, the, the Earth's magnetic field is a product. It's, it's integral to electrical currents and lightning as a whole, the global electric circuit, then causes the Earth's magnetic field in my view. And moreover, even though the, the processes that heat up the, the Earth have decreased over time because the moon has moved away uh, in its orbit, its or orbit has gotten greater. Lightning also, it, like a toaster, when you, when you push the toaster down, it heats up the, the subterranean earth and does and replaces a little bit of what the, the uh, moon and, and the early earth would have had in terms of just being hot inside that you've got a mechanism to heat the subterranean and also to do it in a way, given that life is like a, a, the, it's a person that's controlling the thermostat. So we had with the great oxidation event is not something that I, I look at necessarily as an extinction event, rather it's life as a whole solving a problem which is the Earth's magnetic field. Because if the Earth's magnetic field is too weak, the planet's dead. If it's too strong, the planet's dead. And that's always gonna be a selective pressure, in this case, in my view, to, to, to have life innovate itself, to create 
photosynthesis and then have even more pressure for that type of process to be fostered or to, to be more probabilistic because it created a, a better environment for life. And, and then it goes a certain direction and this, it's like an innovation to help modulate or dampen the Earth's magnetic field with the introduction to photosynthesis. And, and, but then uh, CO2 is removed from the atmosphere, methane is reduced from the, at, is, uh, is uh, oxidized from the atmosphere. And then there appeared snowball Earths. And you can see, again, this is convergence, just like the convergence of technology to see global lightning and to, to see the X-ray pulse coming from the, uh, the sun and then to see undulations in terms of the cloud behaviors uh, with, with what ice is going on. All these technologies are improving. And likewise, uh, the paleo studies have started to give us a great picture of what was going on even way back in time we can look at strata and see that uh, a, a green ocean, low, uh, low uh, oxygen, high iron in the oceans, and then you have oxi oxidation, and then that iron precipitates out, which itself would have had a very significant electrical signal, and hence the signal on the Earth's magnetic field, because now all of a sudden you have this conductive strata in the rock, that it also would affect this toaster effect that we have uh, with lightning and lightning levels. So all of a sudden, life innovated itself by having higher oxygen levels. It wasn't a random catastrophic extinction event that was caused by some mistake in evolution or some random thing in evolution rather very controlled, very much like uh, a, a grassy knoll with a rabbit and then you introduce a predator and um, yeah, the rabbit totals probably go down, but the grass remained green. And, and here the, the ultimate ecology has to do with Earth's magnetic field. If there's no Earth magnetic field, everything, the atmosphere gets stripped away, everything dies. If the Earth's magnetic field is too strong, uh, too much lightning, too, too much, much strong of a global electric circuit, then, then the, the atmosphere uh, is gonna kill everything too. And the, the, it, there's a little bit of self-checking here because if the atmosphere gets too thick, then the potential difference to, to get uh, a, uh, a lead and then to have lightning or plasma behavior where it goes to ground is going to be affected by how uh, thick the atmosphere. This is a very highly tuned um, uh, thing that we have on Earth and um, it's it's modulated or dampened by life that has a quantum level of calculus. Um, and, and so this really changes the, uh, the way we need to look at uh, the, the, the greenhouse, so-called greenhouse gas theory. Um, one example in this whole PBS uh, Eons theory, uh, show is that they were talking about a uh, two million year period of rain. And um, they, they were talking specifically about volcanoes um, that were part of Pangaea. And, and uh, Pangaea at that time started out basically very flat and, and very dry and um, and with certain life forms. But then 
the plants, the trees uh, evolved, and and that's a whole nother issue in terms of trees burning and then the carbon dioxide getting into clouds and then um, again having an electrical effect and specifically the volcanoes I, in my view weren't the cause of of an extinction event but rather the fact that by by having trees innovate and be able to modulate or dampen the Earth's magnetic field um, as, as the sun has become more luminous and as the pterosphere has changed to, in, in response, uh, over time, that life produced these volcanoes. You have uh, you have subduction under the plates and then you have these electrical currents heating the magnet as it's going down. You have uh, a lot of conductivity going on between ocean and then underneath where this subduction is occurring, methane hydrates go down and then you get water in the subduction zone and then you get minerals dissolved in the water you get salt water, it's highly, or mineral water, it's highly conductive. And then, it, and then you get your volcano and it comes up. And that's a very close conductive pathway uh, close to the sky. And again, you affect the ions in, in the sky and you affect, again, the global electric circuit. So the biological innovation comes about and then it changes the pterosphere, it changes plate tectonics, and then the biosphere has to adjust again. It's, it's a highly calculated result of what's coming from space and, and what the Earth's magnetic field is doing. Ultimately, it's about the Earth's magnetic field. Um, that, um, that show. Let's see what my notes here. So they, they were talking. I'm going to try to quote a little bit from the time when the uh, it rained for two two million years. The narrator go, Matt goes, uh, imagine an ocean so warm it feels like a hot tub. Well, the warmer the ocean is, the more conduct salt water when it gets warm. For each degree that it goes up, you have a 1% increase in conductivity. So that's going to affect the, the, how lightning is distributed. Um, one of the interesting things about the volcanoes that that they're talking about is it's not just the quote unquote greenhouse gas effect in the tropics, but it's also when a surface load decarbonates into clouds and you have this electrical complexity, you're going to affect winds, you're going to affect the dynamics. And then the, 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 those dynamics are going to curl up to the, to the north western part of Pangaea and those volcanoes are going to be created because that's where the electrical implication would be. When you have a, when you have a storm and it, it's, it's electrical, you're going to get these capacitive relationships with the saltwater ocean. And so say my hand was positive, then the ocean becomes negative and the clouds move over land, but land is, is 5,000 times more resistive than salt water, especially warm salt water. And so now all of a sudden that capacitive coupling is, is decoupled and just like any capacitor, it's going to discharge. And unlike the movement of the clouds, which would be uh, to the east, the currents move back towards the 
uh, towards the ocean. And as that discharge occurs, and, we, and again, we've, we've seen that here lately, it's this idea of convergence where you're observing things on Earth now, and then you're seeing, looking at the geology and how that has um, broadened our understanding of what's going on. And you can see how specifically in that part of Pangaea, why volcanoes and mountain building processes would have occurred and why the climate changed so much. But then if, it, if the Earth's magnetic field became too strong, then the atmosphere starts to um, become, to take in too much uh, and becomes too, um, uh, doesn't pr provide enough lightning. And so the narrator on this particular show about two million years of lightning said that the biosphere is really good about removing carbonation and that the volcanoes are the cause of this rather than uh, th there's magnetic field driving it and life innovating with different types of plants and how they burn trees um, and then life uh, pressure life uh, changing and as a result of this. Um, so I don't really think that it had to do with C2 being removed from the atmosphere as they say it stayed on that program. Rather, I think it had to do with the fact that if the Earth's magnetic field got too strong, it's going to capture a lot of um, atmosphere from space and then you're going to increase the distance or, or you're going to change the atmosphere's uh, conductivity and, and its ability to develop leads and the potential differences that are involved it's going to decrease lightning and then it's it's going to change the circuitry such that rain is an enhanced and um, so these periods of time are ultimately controlled by what the Earth's magnetic field is and what electrical things are going on, not by uh, volcanoes. And the intellectual problem with this is, is catastrophism, is this idea that it, it's, all, it's all random. So it's like chaos was, chaos is, burn fossil fuels instead of it being contextual. And, and the truth is, is that dampening was, dampening is, sustain a living earth. And, and this is an argument for stewardship, understanding what the mechanisms are, understanding what it is that we're doing as, as human beings on the planet and how then understanding the mechanism all the different things that we're doing, whether we're changing rivers or removing chemicals from outside of the act, active biosphere and putting them into the act, inactive part of the biosphere and removing them and putting them in the active part of the biosphere and then changing the global electric circuit as a result. And so I think that, again, this is an argument that, that and, and really what's on Ian's is an argument too. It's not, it's not reducing kind of science. It's establishing a model of how things were in the past. I don't agree with that model. I think the Earth's magnetic field is the, is the seminal part of this. I think CO2 is not interesting that much as a greenhouse gas and it's way more interesting in clouds in the context of electrical fields how the rate at which uh, water, ice, supercooled water turns into uh, in, into uh, ice, given the carbonation and electrical fields involved. Okay, thank you very much for watching. Please hit like if you like, subscribe if you if you. Uh, I'd encourage you to if you're interested in this topic. Um, I think it's. Uh, what climate is about, what human activity is about. And thank you.